if you've checked us out uh, here on a regular basis here at the Voice of College Football, you know we enjoy the the stats, the facts, the trends. Also, trying to put that into context. Most importantly, uh, we got uh, Josh here from College Football Nerds. They do an exceptional job over there, uh, putting together math models on the games, and of course, their knowledge and interpretation of what the stats are and uh, what is truly meaningful. So again, it's a great watch there at College Football Nerds. We got Josh here to break things down for us entering week six. Josh, appreciate you uh, stopping by. Well, thanks for having me on, Mark. All right. Well, let's get right to it with uh, the SEC. And Georgia has had two competitive games with what are mid to low tier teams, at least at this point in the SEC, South Carolina, coming back from being down a couple scores in that game, scoring 21 straight, and then the last game against Auburn. And what was somewhat surprising about that, although if you understand SEC football and the atmosphere and Jordan-Hare Stadium and all of that, not a big shocker that it was a competitive game, but that Auburn could basically pose no downfield passing threat and still stayed in the game until the final four or five minutes until Carson Beck put a drive together. So with five games in the books, two competitive games. What are your thoughts about Georgia living up to its standard and competing for another national championship? Well, I mean, if the standard is 2021 Georgia and 2022 Georgia, I think Georgia fans probably need to have a lifetime of disappointment because those teams were sort of generational, right? Uh, I don't think it's realistic to expect that kind of outcome. Um, this Georgia team is probably more more like maybe 2012, 2017 Georgia, a, as poor of a team as those were uh, in overall quality. Um, they're not playing quite to the 2017 standard yet either, but uh, still very good teams. And this is still a good Georgia team. A an interesting aspect of that Auburn-Georgia matchup is that we do run a computer model at College Football Nerds. And we you can actually go to run that model yourself at collegefootballnerds.com. It's totally free. Um, and a lot of people blew up at us because we launched it to the public for the first time last week and people ran the Auburn Georgia model and it had Georgia by eight points. Um, and everybody was saying, Oh, look at this model. It's, uh, some people were saying it was busted. Other people were using it as a talking point. I think the sports illustrated Georgia site ran with it a little bit, thought it was interesting. Um, but the thing our model was really flagging is that, you know, and, and we put out a couple tweets about this. Georgia had not allowed three and a half yards of carry in a game, which is a really low number, but every opponent they played set their yard per carry high against Georgia. It's just that they all were so bad at rushing that getting three point, you know, 3.1 yards per carry um, while it looks like you're dominating on the ground and you are in fact dominating. It actually was the worst job anybody had done. One example, South Carolina who had negative rushing yards in their opener against North Carolina, who's a bad defense. So there were signs there of some chinks in the armor for Georgia. Some of those things uh, in terms of gap fits and whatnot, they're going to solve. Some other issues, though, I, I don't know that they necessarily are. They don't have tremendous speed on the edges this year. Um, that really puts a limiter on the defense. They've had some issues with pass rush, particularly with injuries the past few years. Um, but they've had issues because the depth hasn't been phenomenal. And we're starting to see that a little bit coming home. That's just normal turnover. Uh, the other issue that Georgia has, which is a major limiter on that offense, is they replace the offensive tackles. Uh, due to turnover and injury situations, they don't have continuity at the offensive tackle position. And if you don't have good tackles, and you want to look at why Georgia won the national title in 2021 and not Alabama, there's a pretty good reason for that. Um, it, it really limits everything you do offensively. And I actually think Carson Beck's played really well, uh, but the lack of consistency... Uh, at the offensive line really limits what they can do offensively. Um, I think the receivers are very good. Frankly, they're very good, but they're not elite. It's not anything like what Ohio State had last year. Um, and when you combine that with a bad offensive line or an offensive line that's having issues, at least I would say, um, you know, it creates problems. But it's it's not unique to Georgia. I mean, it's the exact same discussion I probably could have with you right now about Ohio State. So if we look at this week's matchup against Kentucky, where we would normally say, okay, Kentucky's ground and pound, they play right into Georgia's hands. Uh, could this be possibly a better matchup than we've seen in the past, considering Ray Davis, the big blue wall. And if Devin Leary can get his act together, they've got options on the outside better than they've had in the past. It's an interesting game. It's one we didn't preview. You know, we do previews of games. We've done a few this week. 
We didn't do this one, just didn't get time for it. Our model has Kentucky by a significant margin. Now, our model is in love with Kentucky to a degree. I don't love, um, again, I, I view our model, it only works on this season's data. It doesn't use priors. Most years, that's drawn complaints. This year, given the world of transfers we're in, it's actually been more accurate. Um, in launch week, we were, we were ahead uh, against the spread against every other major model, including FBI and SP+. It's not sustainable, but 62% against the spread. Um, and I think that was an indication of just how much you really have to look at this year and this year alone. Kentucky is probably undervalued. They are a good team. They run the ball very well. The defense is very good. Our model had them beating Florida by 30 points. Again, everybody was tweeting it and mocking it. Um, and, you know, it was kind of whistling past the graveyard. Uh, and you combine those two things in this game. And, yeah, there's reason to be concerned. But there's also reasons why Georgia's favored by two touchdowns. And the simple answer there is, one, athletically, Kentucky's pretty outmatched. Uh, Georgia has an ability to get guys isolated on linebackers and safeties in particular. And that's the kind of area where sometimes Kentucky starts to struggle a little bit because as much as they're really good, they're really good because they're really sound. Um, and guys like Brock Bowers are a massive problem with teams that don't have tremendous depth or talent all across the board because you can get matchups whoever you want with Brock Bowers. Um, and then offensively, I have never been that high on Leary uh, dating back to his days at NC State. He puts up good numbers against weaker competition, but he's just never processed, gotten the ball out that fast. Um, and you're seeing it against better competition in the SEC. So I, I do think there's a reason why Kentucky is a dangerous team. There's a reason why Georgia's favored. Uh, the outside quarterback runs are what really killed Georgia. And I think it's because of the red speed. And it'll be a problem all year. Kentucky is much more between the tackles running team. They're not going to run the ball with Leary. It's not going to happen. And Georgia's inside defensive play was great against Auburn. They didn't really give a lot up, up the gut, you know, one point for a touchdown on a couple plays, but not much. So I think there are some matchup issues at play, but it's definitely one to watch. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Devin Leary, the 35 touchdown five pick season. I remember running through that and discarding the FCS and the group of fives and so forth. And it uh, dropped significantly after that. Uh, I'm curious about the math model. So you're at 62% against the spread. I'm at 59. So I'm envious there. Number one, number two, I'm envious because you've got a model and I've always wanted to build one. Uh, and I just pick them out of the air. Uh, so, so what do you do with the math model, uh, the first couple of weeks of the season when you don't have the data? So we don't run it. Okay. That's the answer. So there, there's no real solution to this. Most models that exist, FBI, SP plus and whatnot, they work in the first few weeks of the season by taking last year's results, modifying it by some combination of recruiting rankings and returning production, and then spitting out a result. I don't personally love to do that philosophically because I don't really want my model to be a predictor. I want it to be a trend indicator, if that makes sense. Like I, I want the model to tell me, hey, this Kentucky team compared to this Florida team has actually been playing a lot better this year. Um, and sometimes it's going to give you some bad results. Uh, early in the season, we say until week four, we really can't run it because the results are just going to be junk. You're playing weak teams. There's no contextual data. So it takes three or four weeks before we choose to run the model because we feel like the data is relevant enough for it to matter. Um, we could use priors and then we could run it earlier. It'd probably be maybe more profitable from us from a eyeball standpoint. Um, and also there's so many people we deal with that don't understand that we're using it as a trend predictor, not like a score predictor, absolute score predictor. And we get a lot of flack sometimes from that. Um, but you know, I, I think like you, I like to evaluate teams more with my eyes than, than stats. Stats should reinforce your opinion that you get from watching a team. They shouldn't be all you draw from, particularly in college football where everything's so uneven and statistics often exist in these isolated scheduling spaces. Um, so I try to keep our, you know, we try to keep our model as something that we're drawing from and we only really release it week four. So we're 62% against the spread picking all games, but all games in one week <laughs> to this point. So that's a big caveat. Oh, got you there. And, and that's a great thing to keep in mind. And hopefully some people have mercy on you guys watching and, and seeing the final score predictors when that is the case. I, I can, uh, I can relate to your pain there. Uh, looking at, um, we'll stay in the same conference because it's almost a similar dynamic in terms of expectation, tradition, 
and so forth with Alabama versus what we see on the field with a just a return to Greg McElroy and AJ McCarron in regards to an approach in a sense. Of course, Jalen Milrow is a much different athlete than those two. Uh, so, so your thoughts about Alabama and whether this attack of let's run it heavy, I think it was a 43 to 12 run pass ratio against Mississippi State is going to be something that they can take into a college football playoff. I don't think that ratio is realistic. Now, if you watch the game, this was something that really bothered me is that you get narrative sometimes, I think, because of announcers and what they're saying in a ball game. And they kept saying, well, I don't know why they're not letting Milrow throw it. They were trying to let Milrow throw a lot more than he did uh, in that game. There were probably somewhere between six to 12 pass plays called that resulted in sacks or scrambles from Milrow. Now, one of those was a long touchdown run, but they don't want to be four to one. They they maybe want to be two to one, maybe three to two kind of a thing. I, they, they really tried to call that game to be about 30 runs and 20 passes. That's what was actually called in terms of plays, but it doesn't show up on the stat sheet. Um, the problem is that's what they're getting, despite what they're calling. And Milrow right now is a very hesitant quarterback. Um, it, it's easy to say he trusts his legs more than his arm, but I don't know that that's really true. He hasn't been very decisive in bailing the pocket. Uh, there's one play where my partner put out on Twitter where they've got a three-man rush for Mississippi State. Um, it's completely picked up at the line of scrimmage. They got a six man protection and Milrow sort of dances in the pocket and then just starts to jog outside the pocket, which lets the DN that was sitting there completely boxed out of the play, turn around and run down Milrow for an eight yard sack. It's, it's not great. Um, he, he just doesn't quite yet have decisiveness on whether he's going to row or thrun, throw or throw or run. He's jogging outside the pocket when he does commit. He's not running and forcing the defense to react to his legs such that he gets a guy open. He's very rarely ever throwing the ball when he leaves the pocket, which is an interesting point, either to throw it away or to throw to a receiver. I have long had this opinion with Nick Saban that one of his, you know, and Alabama fans maybe plug your ears, he's not a perfect coach. He's probably the best that's ever done it, but he's not perfect as no one is. Um he tends to want his quarterbacks to earn the team, maybe to a degree that is counterproductive. And, you know, mentioned AJ McCarron, he and Phillip Sims were in a QB battle years ago. And to start that season, they got really inconsistent play from McCarron there in 2011. Um, They played a pretty bad Penn state team, as I recall, and they were able to beat them because the defense was legendarily good. Um, but the quarterback play wasn't great because when you do that and you get into week three or four before you establish a starter, you know, all these reps you could have had in the summer, in the fall, where you have a dedicated starter, you're building an offense around him, you build the scheme around him, you get him confidence. Confidence with the QB comes in clean reps, either in practice or against bad opponents. That all kind of gets thrown away. And we're seeing the blowback from that. I mean, they didn't even play Milrow against South Florida, a chance for them to get even more comfort level. And so now they got a guy where for most teams, this would be like his game two comfort level. And he's in, what are we, like week five, week six? <laughs> you know, that that's not good. So it's a real limiter on their offense. They need to play at a higher level. I don't know that any of the backup quarterbacks, to be clear, are a better option. I think Milrow is the best option they have. Um, but they're going to have to promove, improve tremendously uh, in the passing game if they want to have a shot at the playoffs. And... Yeah, I mean, we've seen it before. 2010 Alabama with with Greg McElroy was a team that couldn't score 28 points against a meaningful opponent. Um, that's kind of where Alabama is right now. They're going to go as far as the defense can carry them. And if they're in a real game against a real team and it ends up any sort of a shootout, I, I can't say that I like their chances right now. Yeah, well, hopefully they've figured out what they can do with him. And that seems to be pretty obvious. Uh, you don't want him going through reads and uh, trying to break down a defense in that sense. Uh, We got Josh uh, here from College Football Nerds uh, looking at the college football landscape, and we'll take you, Josh, to the Big Ten. So Michigan's the champion. They're the bully. They play in a phone booth for the most part. That's at least the narrative. Ohio State, obviously, with the toys on the outside, uh, play a softer uh, brand of football, according to Lou Holtz and others. And then you got Penn State uh, new to the party or proposed new to the party and taking a serious shot at these two 
uh, that's just loaded on all three levels of the defense with first and second rounders. Uh, has anything played out thus far that you think is meaningful with really one of them being tested to the hilt? You know, Ohio State's the only one that's really been truly tested, right? Uh, Penn State did play Iowa and shut them out. Now that was, it's both a pro and a con, and this is the unfortunate thing when you play limited teams for Penn State, that they set an all-time record for play disparity. I think it was 90 plays to 30, something like that. Yeah. Um, that one hand means that you're a really good team. And I will say right now, we've, we're have we working on sort of a beta 1 through 133 version of our ratings. Um, and I figured I'd, I'd sort of cite that. Penn State is actually second in that system. Again, very much a work in progress. Ohio State's only 14th. Michigan is only 16th. That's absolute value power rating based only on this this year's play. And I'll say for for context, um, Alabama's 13, Ohio State's 14, Michigan's 16, Georgia's 18, which is kind of kind of interesting. Penn State's in a different tier, but Penn State's competition has been substantially less. They've dominated that competition. But what we saw last year from Penn State, if you really go look at the results, they dominated lesser competition and then they didn't scale, meaning, you know, some teams do a better job of scaling against other good teams than uh, than other ones do. Jimbo Fisher's teams at Texas A&M, that whole pro style offense that everybody makes fun of actually scales really well. Like it's there's a reason to use it in the NFL. That style of offense works against good defenses. It's just it doesn't necessarily blow out bad defenses. Um, and Penn State has not scaled well in recent years, so I need to see them play a different competition. And even in the Iowa game, when you're getting the ball every three plays like they are, it necessarily means that your offense is going to have a lot of advantages because the opposing defense is going to get worn down. Uh, Michigan just really hasn't been tested yet, uh, and and I still don't really know what we're going to get from them until that happens. Uh, and Ohio State, we have seen them get tested some. I mean, Indiana – was was a game they won, but it wasn't didn't run pretty. Uh, and between that and the Notre Dame game, it's becoming really clear. Like I mentioned earlier with Georgia, they have issues at the offensive line. Uh, we flagged that in our preview, just looking at the spring game. Their tackle play is is just bad. It's just bad. The entire offense is being limited as a result of that. I think the defense is the kind of salty defense they've wanted to see for years, which is a shame given the situation. Kyle McCord sometimes gets heat. Much like Carson Beck, he is not the problem to my eyes. When I watch him play, yeah, there's some things he could do a little bit better. Yeah, he's not C.J. Stroud, who, to be clear, we thought should have been the number one pick in the draft last year, actually. Um, but he's still quite good, and he's doing everything he's supposed to do. They just don't give him time. They don't have the time to run the kind of routes that they ran last year. They don't have the time to get vertical, which means they don't have the time to really leverage Marvin Harrison Jr., and even when you have really good receivers, if, if the play's short and they can play tight to you and they can play within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage, it is much easier for defensive backs to stay in good coverage with receivers versus if they know the play can go long because now they got to give a cushion because if you try to play tight with Marvin Harrison and you give him four or five seconds to throw, he is going over the top on you. Um, and without that threat, it's really changed the dynamics, I think, of that Ohio State team. Um, and I say that not to say they're the worst in the other ones. I just think they're the only ones that are really have been tested in a legit game where they had to try. Um, and as I said, they're still rated higher than Michigan in our, our system. And I don't, I couldn't tell you if Michigan's sandbagging or if it's who they are, but relative to who they played, they've been good, but not overly impressive. So uh, still very much a quagmire in the big 10, I think. Josh, as soon as you mentioned the name Iowa, I thought, I wonder if Iowa breaks your model or or if they fall just in, in line with the model and are so predictable because you know as well as I do what this team has been doing for years and years and years. They haven't had a top 90 offense in quite a few years. They haven't had a top 50 offense since 2006. They're right now next to last, and I know it's the um, surface statistic of yards per game. And we could delve a little bit deeper in there in the bottom five, regardless of what you pull up in regards to their offensive production. And in classic Iowa style, of course, won the game last week on a special teams punt return touchdown with four minutes left in the game, which I chuckled and thought, OK, yeah, the special teams won the game and the defense is not going to give it up. So they just won the game, even though there's still 345 on the clock. Uh, I would think, yeah, this this Iowa team would either uh, be perfect for your model because they're so predictable in one sense, or there's such an aberration that maybe they don't fit. 
Yeah, it's hard to say. Um, I think, yeah, they probably are a team that's more predictable. Our, our model, without giving away the secret sauce, <clears throat> it comes at things from a different perspective than other models do. It's a little more based on relational data. And then the scoring model is self-trained on each individual's team based on their own results this year relative to their own statistics. Um, you know, I, I've never really tried to argue that one approach is necessarily better or worse than others. They just have advantages or disadvantages. We've had advantages this year, as I said, because the lack of re heavy reliance on priors has been good in this post-transfer world. We've got Colorado like 40 slots higher than most of the other uh, most of the other models because we're just looking at what they play like this year. A lot of models will say you look at like SP plus and frankly, they're way too low, but yeah, overall it's that, that approach has been more accurate in the past. Um, yeah, Iowa, I just pulled it up. They're like 51st in that same sort of power rating metric. I just talked about it, They are a good defense and a bad offense. Um, uh, my partner, I think is ready to throw Brian France out a window. Um, a lot of other people are too. Uh, it, it, the the odds of them making 25 points a game do go down every week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, and it's, you know, if I was an Iowa fan, Iowa fan, frankly, I'd be pretty furious because at some point, at some point you gotta be blunt. The word nepotism has to come up. Those are public dollars being given to an offensive coordinator that has proven that he's not competent over multiple years. Um, and he's getting paid a lot of money, way too much money, I think, uh, to get a lot of grace in that regard. Um, when you have that kind of position and you don't produce for multiple years, um, you know, it, that, that you, you got to take heat and they they well deserve that heat. Oh, we've certainly addressed it here many times. Absolutely. And, uh, that 25 points per game, I would have had less issue with it still would have had an issue, but less if it was strictly an offensive point system. Uh, that's a total point system for a defense and special teams that typically scores more points than any defense and special teams units in the country. They scored six touchdowns last year.